Welcome to NatSec Tech, a podcast from the Special Competitive Studies Project. I'm Jean Meserve. Last week, hundreds of prominent tech executives and artificial intelligence researchers signed a statement that sounded like it was inspired by a science fiction movie. The statement read, mitigating the risk of extinction from AI should be a global priority alongside other societal scale risks such as pandemics and nuclear war. One of the signatories joins us today. Eric Brynjolfsson is the Jerry Yang and Akiko Yamazaki Professor and Senior Fellow at the Stanford Institute for Human-Centered AI and Director of the Stanford Digital Economy Lab. He's also the Ralph Landau Senior Fellow at the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research, Professor by Courtesy at the Stanford Graduate School of Business and Stanford Department of Economics, and a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research, as well as the author of several books. Thanks so much for joining us today. My pleasure. So why did you sign this, frankly, very dramatic statement? Well, um, I've been in awe of the increasing power of artificial intelligence, and it can do so many good things. I believe it's going to likely increase productivity dramatically. It could help uh, cure a lot of diseases and help with a lot of the other societal problems. At the same time, uh, with great power comes great risk and great responsibility. And there are ways that these technologies can be abused in many ways. They can create new kinds of viruses that might help us, but it could also be very harmful or new kinds of toxins or uh, help people break into uh, nuclear weapons sites or could be used for mass disinformation. Uh, some of these risks uh, could hurt uh, or even kill millions of people. And I think we need to, just as we embrace the opportunities, we also have to be aware of some of the risks and the challenges. Some people have said it's too alarmist. You disagree? Well, the technology is not going to decide for itself what happens to us. We're going to decide. And if we're careful, I believe we can have a really good outcome. But it's going to take conscious effort, just as we had conscious effort to control nuclear weapons. And uh, we should have done more to control the pandemic. Um, but if we're not conscious about it, then there are some real risks. And I don't know if alarmist is the right word, but, but being cautious is the right thing. Cautious and conscientious effort by whom? Really everyone. I, I think that technologists that I've spoken to, many of them are taking it very seriously. Uh, part of the danger is that we don't fully understand this technology. There's a, a emergent capabilities that we hadn't expected, the ability to code or translate languages. And so we don't know what else might emerge. Uh, policymakers need to be careful about this. Managers and executives need to be careful about this. Um, at some point, there needs to be uh, international cooperation and regulation as well. So the statement didn't say that. It didn't suggest specific steps that should be taken. Why is that? And what are the specific steps you'd like to see? I think it's a really tough question. Um, the technologies are very new. Capabilities are evolving very quickly. I think there's a lot of disagreement about what the next steps are. I'll do a little bit of a cop out and say we need to study and understand better what some of the possibilities are. There was an earlier letter that many of you may recall of calling for a six month pause that some people signed. I did not sign that one because it didn't seem to be like a helpful step. Um, but Right now, our capabilities are way outrunning our wisdom. The ability of the technology to do things is far ahead of our ability to understand how to put safety around it. With many technologies in the past, uh, we first deployed them, then some bad things happened. You know, cars crashed and then we invented seat belts. We burned our hands and developed fire extinguishers. Um, and that's a common pattern. But when the risks get really large, we have to do the harder thing of trying to anticipate the risks. And we haven't done that hard work yet. Why not take the pause? Well, if there really could be a pause on all dimensions, I might consider it, but, but there's two problems with the pause. First is, in effect, it would only pause responsible people. Irresponsible people would plow ahead. So you're almost doing the opposite of what you'd like. You, you would put the technology increasing in the hands of people who aren't careful. And obviously that's not a good outcome. Secondly, as I said at the top of the show, 
I'm really excited about all the positive things that the technology can do. And what I'd like to do is see an acceleration of those positive capabilities, even as we accelerate even more our ability to uh, control and mitigate the risks. So um, there's a gap right now between what we can do and our wisdom. I'd like to close that by improving our wisdom, not by reducing our capabilities. So I heard one analyst voice some skepticism. He said that tech executives were trying to look good by signing this statement when they know absolutely nothing is going to be done in terms of regulation in particular. Thoughts? I understand the cynicism. And obviously, in many cases, technologists have not done what's right for society. And we've had some bad outcomes. But I can tell you, I've been speaking to many of these people since before they were successful tech executives, um, conversations in, the, in you know, 10 years ago. Um, and many of them had the same kind of thinking that this was a, that there were some risks, there were some opportunities, and they wanted to be careful about the risks. Um, this is a topic people have, some people have been thinking about for a while. Um, right now, the mitigation of the risks um, is something that also may line up with some of their economic self-interest. Um, and, and so be it, you know, um, that doesn't make them any less sincere about being concerned about the risks. And I, I do think that when you can find regulation that uh, works is a win-win, it'll be much easier to adopt it. But the companies I've seen are a little bit worried about a, uh, a prisoner's dilemma or race to the bottom where uh, their competitors do unsafe things and then they feel compelled to keep up doing unsafe things or else lose market share. And they would prefer a regulation that applied to everybody. Uh, that's not irrational for them to want that kind of regulation, either from their own self-interest or from societal interest. At the moment, do we have that race to the bottom going on? There's a little bit of it going on. I, I don't think the current technologies are you know, super dangerous, but we can see a path where they become more dangerous. But when uh, OpenAI uh, released it, its pr chat GPT product, we all saw that it, it had some funky aspects to it. It hallucinated and would say false things. Uh, most of us thought it was kind of funny the way uh, Kevin Ruth uh, had the uh, conversation where uh, ChatGPT said it was in love with him and he should leave his wife. And, you know, it was mostly harmless, but you can see that they're uh, not quite ready for prime time on some dimensions. Uh, maybe it was good that we saw some of the weaknesses of it as well as some of the strengths. Uh, but, you know, if and when ChatGPT five comes out or six, it'll have a whole new set of capabilities. And, and at some point, it won't be so funny when it does really stupid things and really uh, uh, false things and creates, say, deep fakes of uh, important political figures saying things that they didn't really say. Uh, there's ways that it can go wrong. And, and so we, we should anticipate that rather than wait, waiting for bad things to happen. One of the big fears about this new generation of AI is that it could cause mass joblessness. You study the impact of AI on the economy. What do you foresee, first, in terms of productivity? So first, in terms of productivity, I'm very bullish, much more bullish than the Congressional Budget Office. I think it's probably going to be double what they're projecting. I just had a paper with my colleagues, uh, Martin Bailey and Anton Koronek. Uh, where we described a, a coming productivity boom in the 2020s, um, because this technology is affecting so many aspects of society. 60% uh, or more of the tasks done in an information knowledge-based economy like the United States can be aided by these tools. In most cases, as you're suggesting, uh, not, not by automating, but by augmenting them, allowing people to do new things and boost their productivity. So that's really good news. We're, unlike some of the earlier technologies, we're already seeing big productivity boosts. I, I did a paper where we looked at call centers and looked at millions of transcripts. And what we found was that the people who used an LLM-based system uh, were up to 35% more productive in terms of answering customer questions, customer sentiment went up, customer satisfaction went up, employee turnover went down. So just on every dimension, it, it, it turned out better. Interestingly, the least experienced workers benefited the most. Um, so this was kind of a, an equalizer in a sense, boosting productivity, but also reducing inequality. Um, and I could go on with more examples of, of those productivity boosts. You asked about jobs. Um, there, uh, I, I am concerned about um, 
different sections of the economy being affected in uneven ways. And it's going to, I'm, I'm quite confident it's going to be a lot of disruption. Uh, there's going to be winners and losers. I actually do not project mass unemployment anytime soon. Why not? I mean, why wouldn't a business just replace employees with machines if the machines can do the job? It would be easier. It would be cheaper. You know, that, that's a great question. I, I think there will be some aspect of that. Uh, but what people massively underestimate is, is two things. One, that um, there's far more opportunity for augmenting people than replacing them. In the call center um, that, that I studied, it was a huge success specifically because they kept humans in the loop. I think we've all have been frustrated by talking to one of those automated systems that helps with some questions but can't handle other questions. And humans just have much more breadth of uh, ability to handle different kinds of situations, unexpected situations. And for a lot of reasons, we will see humans continue to be in the loop for, for quite a while. And so it'll augment what they're doing. Secondly, when there are shocks, and, uh, and, and by the way, that often leads to more people employed, not fewer people employed. I mean, uh, one example I, I wrote about recently was just you know going back and looking historically at, at what jet engines did for pilot productivity. You know, obviously pilots are far more productive flying jets than they would with propeller planes. Does that mean we need fewer pilots? No, actually there've been more pilots because air travel went up and people were demanding more. So that's been the trend. We're right now close to record low unemployment in the United States economy. Uh, going forward, I think there'll be some disruption. There will be places where there are fewer jobs, uh, others where there are more jobs, but the number of tasks that are needed in the economy and that can only be done by humans is enormous. So as we say, have less need for food production, we ended up having a lot more people doing other things, doing podcasts like you and I are doing right now, or uh, video games or uh, uh, personal services or software. There's so many different categories of new technologies and, and new tasks being uh, emerging. We're not at anywhere near the end of work, um, at least not in this decade. Um, and that makes me pretty confident that there'll still be jobs. But I do want to stress that that doesn't mean lack of disruption. People will have to move around to new tasks. Some wages are going to go up, some are going to go down. So uh, disruption, yes. Mass unemployment, no. So you're quite the optimist. We talked to the pessimist uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Ramsey Brown, the CEO and founder of Mission Control. Mm -hmm. He didn't compare this to the advent of the jet engine, uh, the analogy you just gave. He said it's more like the uh, the introduction of the combustion engine and all those horses and all those people that did things associated with horses that found themselves out of work. Mm -hmm. He thinks AI is going to have that kind of impact. What would you say to him? Um, I think it's a very useful analogy. I wrote a paper literally called with Andrew McAfee called, Will Humans Go the Way of Horses? And I analyzed some of the reasons that it was similar and some of the reasons it was different. The breadth of things that people do, thankfully, is, is much broader. And when I look around our economy, I see so many tasks that only humans can do and that need to be done, whether it's in childcare, helping with the environment, uh, a lot of creative work, or just interpersonal skills. Now, someday... But they can do some of that work. The creative work, for instance. Yeah. We, we're reading all the time about chat GPT writing love poems and composing music. I think it's great for that. I, I, I actually used... I wrote a, a love poem to my wife for uh, uh, Valentine's Day with chat GPT. I told her. I didn't, I didn't lie to her. Uh, she thought it was great. Um, I, I, but I, I steered it. I told it what I knew and what I thought would be appropriate. I went through a few different iterations and those of us, you know, I think most people, hopefully your listeners have, have played with ChatGPT and the other tools. And they, they, I think hopefully they're smart enough not to just turn on, walk away and just take the first thing that comes out. That rarely is what you really want. You want to prompt it correctly and steer it. And people, I think there's going to be a flourishing of poetry, of fiction, of nonfiction, of uh, uh, visual arts, where people are steering these tools to create new things they never created before. Um, it's going to be a democratizing force that will have a lot more people creating a lot more cool stuff than they did before. Well, what about the practical, uh, you know, real work? Uh, well, I yeah. shouldn't say this. My son's a creative. He'd be very offended if he heard me say that creative work wasn't real work. But um, what about doctors, for instance? Aren't there a lot of, or, or people in the medical field, there are a lot sure. of uh, functions that could be performed by machines instead of humans? No question. Lawyers. 
um, they could write contracts. L- let me go through a few of those. Uh, so in 2017, Jeff Hinton, brilliant machine learning, father uh, really of deep learning, um, said, we need to stop training radiologists because machines can read medical images better than humans can. Um, today, as far as I can tell, there are more radiologists. I was just looking at job postings. Those job postings for radiologists have actually gone up significantly since 2017. So we've not seen mass unemployment for this category where I agree with Jeff that uh, machines can read medical images very well. It turns out that if you look more closely at the job of a radiologist, there are at least 26 distinct tasks that a radiologist does. They consult patients, they consult with other doctors, um, they sometimes manage equipment, uh, may, they may do conscious sedation. There are a lot of things that you really do not want a machine doing. And the fact that a machine can help with one of the tasks, a really important one, reading the image, um, but, but not the others, means that you still have demand for radiologists. In fact, radiologists can now look at more images than they did before. And so we get more diagnoses and more help than we did before. And it's it really, it's a little bit like my pilot example with the, the jet engines. It's actually led to increased demand and opportunity. Likewise, in the legal profession, there are many tasks that can now be done better by machines. And that will change the job of a lawyer tremendously, a lot less uh, sifting through boxes of documents, trying to find the key phrase, and a lot more thinking about what is our legal strategy? How do we uh, come to a negotiation with this partner? Uh, what are our options? Um, so it, it, the jobs, all of our jobs are changing. I think uh, 60, 70% of the jobs in the economy are subject to significant change and disruption. Until we get AGI, artificial general intelligence, that can do everything that humans can do, um, which is a ways off, I think that there's going to be continued demand for humans in the loop. Will wages go down? Wages are going to go up and down for different people. That's the way it's always been. Technology has always been destroying jobs. It's always been creating jobs. Um, Some of those guys who uh, were putting horseshoes uh, on horses, uh, their demand fell. Uh, People who are driving taxis or trucks or building supermarkets that were now feasible or coming up with product marketing strategies for supermarkets that had 100,000 different goods, those people had growing demand. And so people are going to have to reskill. And I think they're going to have to reskill faster than you did in the past. One of my concerns is that CEOs and employees don't have enough visibility into which tasks will be affected in a positive way and a negative way. Um, I've, uh, I've, I've started a company called Work Helix in part to help with that, where we look at the tasks that are done in different companies and prioritize which ones are most likely to be affected by large language models and other tools and where the growth is likely to be and where the, um, the reductions are likely to be. I, I would not in any way promise lack of change. I think there's going to be a ton of change, but handled right, it, it's what the way that America and other countries have always succeeded is by embracing change and, uh, and embracing dynamism rather than trying to lock in just the way we did things in the past. Here in the U.S., we've been hearing for decades about the need to retool our educational systems and retrain our workers, and yet it hasn't really happened. Are you confident that it will? I, I'm i kind of an optimist, so I'm hopeful that it will. My industry, I think, has been the slowest. I'm a, I'm a teacher, and I have to say it's embarrassing that sometimes I go into a classroom and I take a, a, piece, a stone, a piece of chalk, and scratch it across another stone. I'm thinking, wait a minute, is this the 21st century? And I'm, it's like I could be in a cave somewhere, and that's how I, I convey knowledge. We could do so much better. And I've been working with uh, large language models to create personalized education. I think that the opportunity for coaching and individualized instruction is just enormous. There's research that shows it's about a two standard deviation improvement when you get that kind of personalized instruction. Historically, that's only been possible with a human tutor. Now, more and more, uh, Khan Academy and others are developing tools that provide much more personalized instruction. I would love to see that more widely adopted. My kids love to play with Khan Academy. I know not everybody does, but as you personalize it more, it could be better. I I had a, uh, I was working with a model that would teach uh, algebra through word problems. It was great at generating really interesting word problems. And then as a little twist, I asked it, okay, now do it with the tone of a pirate or do it the tone of Taylor Swift, or do it the tone of Santa Claus, or whoever. And it was hilarious. Um, 
I think a good teacher not only conveys the knowledge, but also does it in an entertaining way. There's a real opportunity to do much better than we're doing now. So I've read conflicting things about the societal impact of these workforce changes. Some people say that it provides an opportunity to make the workforce more inclusive, to involve different populations uh, in this kind of work. But others say it just further concentrates wealth and power in the hands of a very few. Which camp are you in? Both. (laughs) So... um, I'm very much in the camp of that this is not something that the technology decides and it's just going to happen to us. It's a question of what we decide and how we use it. It can be used to concentrate wealth and power, and especially the past decade or so, that's happened a lot. Uh, The uh, inequality has grown in the United States. Uh, People with a high school education or less have fallen behind, not just economically, but there've been growing deaths from despair. Uh, life, life, life expectancy has been falling for that group. Uh, suicide, alcoholism, depression have been going up. So it, it's it's a catastrophe in part because of uh, what's happened in the economy. There are broader forces at work as well. Um, and that's not the way we want to use the technology. At the same time, the technology can be used and should be used to be more inclusive. It can be used, as I said, to give everybody a personalized education, not just rich people who can afford a tutor. It can be used to give a fairer shake when people are applying for jobs that instead of a potentially or likely biased human resource manager or hiring manager making judgments based on their gut instincts, which we know are flawed and biased, it could be based on more objective metrics that are designed intentionally to draw from a broader pool and make sure everybody has a chance. Um, I'm, I, I've been calling the, uh, the alarm, the opportunity for us to pay more attention to using these tools in ways that are inclusive, that benefit the many, not just the few. But I do not think it's going to happen automatically. It'll only happen if we really work hard at it. Are the right incentives in place to do that? Not necessarily. Um, they can be if more people pay attention. Uh, The incentives come from all of us making these choices and demanding it from our managers, demanding it from our elected employees and and the executives who care about a fairer world, uh, because I think it's not only in the interest of society, I think it's in their own self-interest. My friend, uh, one of my friends said that, you know, uh, uh, capital uh, survives with the permission of democracy. and, And that's true. So if you don't have people buying into it, Uh, they're going to revolt, and then uh, nobody wins. How critical do you think it is that the U.S. lead in this technology? It's really important. I think, you know, I I share uh, American values. America is not just a a nation, you know, that's it's not a nation that's ethnic. It's a nation that's based on values and principles of freedom, democracy. And um, I would love to see more countries benefit from those values. not all countries share those values. And if uh, AI is such a powerful technology, if other countries with different values come to dominate the AI race, it'll be harder for uh, people around the world to, to, uh, to benefit from democracy and freedom. And what about the countries that are not competitive in AI? Is it going to increase the disparities between the nations that have and the nations that have not? This is a real challenge that we need to address. Just as we need to address it within the country, we need to address it internationally. I uh, teach a class at Stanford. And uh, yesterday, uh, we had a discussion with uh, our our guest speaker. And uh, there was a discussion in the United States and Europe. And one of the students uh, was from Africa and said, wait a minute, what about the global south? You know, why aren't they part of the conversation? And what should we be doing to make to include them as part of the decision makers? Right now, um, I think it's not just the global south that's being left out, really even big parts of the United States. uh, A lot of the uh, technology is being developed within like 10 miles of my house here at Stanford. (laughs) Um, So it's really a a pretty concentrated group of people. Uh, I think most of them are are very well-meaning and and want to do right, but they can't help but be somewhat insular in their uh, perspectives and their values. And we should do more to uh, be inclusive across the United States and across the world. Eric, I'd love to distill this down to a couple of key choices that you think are in front of us right now. Well, um, I usually 
when someone asks me this question, I can't help but put education at the top of the list. Uh, I'm an educator, so I'm voting with my feet. Uh, maybe I'm biased, but um, these technologies can do amazing things. But as we're saying earlier, um, a lot of people don't have the right skills to benefit from them. And I'm not just talking about technical skills. I'm talking about uh, being able to have the, the creative, the management, uh, the entrepreneurial skills to really use these technologies to the fullest. And we could do a lot more to educate and train the skills. That's how a big part of how America's always been successful. I'd also like to see more investment, uh, not just in the technology per se, but especially in the safety side of things, having our wisdom keep up with our capabilities. Right now, I see a big lag between the wondrous things my technological colleagues are doing, um, and kudos to them. I'm, I'm proud of what they've accomplished at, at Stanford, other universities, at companies around the world. Um, but economists like me, sociologists, uh, people working in other social sciences, I don't think we're keeping up as much as we should. And as a result, policymakers aren't getting the tools they need. So we need to invest more in that as well. So who has the responsibility for making the right decisions? Is it the technologists? Is it the business people? Is it the policymakers? Is it all three? Yeah, I have to say all three, which is not, you know, it sounds like a little bit of a cop out, but, but the reality is that um, I run into people who are too siloed in one or two of those areas. And as a result, they can't really cut across. So there's technologists who don't really appreciate the societal implications, what's, what it means for the economy, uh, some of the ethical side of things. And then there are, are social scientists who, who don't have a clue about what the technology can and cannot do. They may have read something in science fiction, but it, it's very unrealistic. And I just came back from Washington. And I have to say, I came back actually kind of gratified at how much interest there was among people in the executive branch. I met with folks in the White House, in Congress, uh, in some of the agencies at the Department of Labor. Um, who really were hungry for learning more and had read some of my papers and some of the other work that uh, that has been coming out to try to uh, get up to speed. They understood they didn't have all the answers yet, but that's okay. What they did have was a, a curiosity to get more informed. And uh, that made me hopeful that we're on the right track. And the consequences, if we get this wrong? Well, you know, the coming decade is an incredibly consequential one. We have more powerful technologies than we've ever had in history, and they're rapidly improving. And that means to me that the next decade could be the best decade in human history, but it could also be the worst or one of the worst if we don't play this right. I really think the stakes are very high. I think there's a lot of agency and choice in which way it goes. And I think we need to be much more conscious about uh, what our values are and what we'd like to see the technology do. Uh, we have, you know, we shouldn't be as we shouldn't be passive and just think, well, let's see what happens. We should be active in saying, how do we want to steer this technology so we create, as you asked, as you mentioned earlier, uh, an inclusive society that economically uh, benefits everybody, but benefits them on other dimensions, environmentally and, and social justice. Um, that's something that we can make a choice about something that upholds some of our values uh, for freedom, freedom of speech, uh, freedom to uh, go and move where you want to be. Uh, I'd like to see more immigration so people can live wherever they want to be. Um, but these are, these are values we all need to discuss and decide, um, are we embodying these values in our technologies or are they being used to create a, a more of a surveillance state, a more authoritarian uh, kind of society? There are other countries that would prefer that kind of outcome. And uh, if we're not careful, we're going to end up going down that path here, too. As the statement said, mitigating the risk of extinction from AI should be a global priority alongside other societal scale risks such as pandemics and nuclear war. Eric Brynjolfsson, thank you so much for joining us here today. Well, thank Appreciate you for it. having me. It was, it was great to have this conversation with you. Eric is the Jerry Yang and Akiko Yamazaki Professor and Senior Fellow at the Stanford Institute for Human-Centered AI and Director of the Stanford Digital Economy Lab. I'm Jean Meserve. Thanks a lot for joining us for another episode of NatSec Tech, a podcast from the Special Competitive Studies Project. Hope you'll do so again. Take care.